Okay. Welcome everyone to the Winter Quarter, the lecture series. We've got a great lineup. Yay! If you don't know our WordPress site, it is blogs.evergreen.edu slash art lecture series, all one word. Um, so, week three we have Amaranth Borsuk and Andy Fitch. They're writers. Week five, we have Thierry de Duve, who is our Evans Chair Scholar, who will be here weeks three, four, five. Um, and we'll try to, I've got a schedule of um, public talks um, and also lectures that he's giving to a couple programs, and those are open for people to stop in on. Um, so I'll try to get those posted publicly, maybe on the, actually on the website. It's good space for that. Week six is Allison Cobb. So we've got writers and art historians so far, and a couple of visual artists. Week seven is M.K. Guth, and week nine is Johanna Goss, another art historian. So we've got a varied lineup. Um, the Save Evergreen Gallery petition is still um, alive and working. We don't have any resolutions on that, so we need to keep pushing forward, the news is that since October, there is a, a group of students, staff, and faculty, and they've met, and also alumni and families, and I guess Olympia community, they've met with um, the provost, Michael Zimmerman, and the president, Les Purse. Um, they've got 450 signatures, and, and 350, plus 350 online, so a total of 800. The petitions are up on the middle counter in the room if you haven't signed already. Um, so we can, so if those of you who don't know the gallery, the funding for the gallery is um, being potentially cut or is being cut. So we need to figure out alternate sources of income to keep it alive. If you haven't been there, go um, show up, show your interest. Um, it's, a, it's a nice space, it was renovated recently, we want to keep it, we want to actually make it more vibrant and keep, keep working on it, so let's um, show support for it. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to have Alex McCarty here. He is um, currently teaching um, with Lisa Sweet in a program called Studio Projects Tradition and Innovation, and um, it's, it's, gonna, it's really, um, we're lucky to have someone who is focused on tradition. Uh, we, don't always, we don't always have that direct a connection as, as Alex does. He is a carver, a painter, and a printmaker. He's a macaw artist. Um, his great-grandfather was um, chief of Watch Village, one of five villages in Nia Bay, which is in the north, northmost corner. Um, of the continent, I think, right? Or between us of, of the United States. Um, in his bio that I was given, it says that he's a young carver with respect for older carving traditions. Um, and his interest in macaw carving in particular and culture was triggered in high school when he was um, asked to work on a diorama for, of the Ozette Village for the Macaw Museum. And if any of you have not been to that museum, it's a really um, evocative and lovely place um, up in Nia Bay, so you should travel there. Um, he has a, I'm not gonna go into too much more about his work because he will speak about it, but he did go to school here both as an undergraduate. In fact, we just, I just learned that my teaching partner, Greg Mullins, was his first faculty, his first quarter 17 years ago here and influenced his writing and his art practice, Greg, great working with Greg did. So he has a BA from Evergreen um, in, in visual arts and social studies and he has a master's of teaching from Evergreen um, as well. Right now he's got work in the library um, and photographs of his working with students in front of photo land. Okay. Okay, okay, so let's welcome Alex. I'm going to uh, turn the lights down a little bit. 
it said for note taking. <laughs> so I thought I'd put that out there. <laughs> uh, yeah, so can everybody hear me in the back? Is it good? Good? Okay. And you can always let me know. Um, so my name is Alex McCarty, and I'm a, a local artist. Uh, and I, um, it's honored to be here to kick off uh, this Winter Quarters Artist Lecture Series. And um, I think we'll just move forward. So uh, thank you, Shaw, for your words. And I, I wrote it up here of, of my educational background because I am proud to be a greener. And actually, uh, this has brought me uh, to where I am today. So, you know, I, I had the focus from my, my goals from uh, the beginning of my career was to be an interdisciplinary educator and an exhibiting artist. And that is what I knew I wanted to do as soon as I stepped foot on this campus. And that is that goal, that focus, is what got me in to where I, I was able to get my master's in teaching degree and then do interdisciplinary teaching that, that I'm currently doing today. And so it's, it's, uh, it's very thought out and very direct. And there's some things I wanted to talk about today. And th these, these are some of the threads that I'm going to be weaving today. They're going to be uh, focused on library research, museum archives, regional styles of Northwest Native design, uh, workshops, and also coursework, and how that affects my work as an educator and also as a exhibiting artist. And here's my map. <laughs> Shaw was talking about uh, where I'm from. So if you look, this is why I was glad I have a, a mic that I can hold on to because I, I can't stand in one place. So here's uh, the Makar Indian Reservation. It's the northwest tip of Washington. And then we're down here at the end of the Puget Sound. This is Olympia. And so where I'm from is really close uh, to, to, to uh, Olympia. It is the northwest tip of Washington. And the most interesting part is, uh, if you've never been up to Nia Bay, you, you should go to the Cape. Because what we call ourselves is uh, the Kodichyak people. And that means the people of the rocks. And when you go out and you see the rocks, they are literally 100 foot rock cliffs. When they say the end of the US continent, it literally means that you're going to fall off. Uh, you know, a, a really big cliff into the water. So that's where I'm from. And um, this, this map that I'm showing you is I'm particularly interested in regional styles of Northwest Native design. And the work that I do is focused on its New Channel and Macaw. And then down here, there's, uh, that's West Coast style. And then we have Coast Salish, which is South Coast all the way down to the Columbia River. And then you've got mid coast. And then you've got the north, northwest coast up here. And uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, as I go through the, the lecture. So I wanted to show you the, the map to give you a context of what I'll be referring to. So like Shaw was saying, Back, it, this was when I was actually graduating. Uh, it was two weeks before I graduated from, from high school. And the curator of the museum approached me and he invited me to work with him at the museum, at the Macaw Museum up, uh, up, up in Nia Bay. And um, he said that we'll be making a miniature model diorama of the Ozette village. And you know, at, at this point, I had absolutely no idea what he was talking about, except for that you know, we had a, you know, a, a whole bunch of old stuff that got dug up 
you know, and it's, it, it's about, you know, Nia Bay. So I, I had really no idea what I was getting into and how much that that would, that job and, and creating this model would affect my, my career uh, up in, into today. And so I, I, I worked with them for about a year and we made what we thought the Ozet Village would look like. It would be a day in the life of the Ozet Village pre-contact uh, about 500 years ago. So we did a lot of research in the archives and we went and visited different museums like the Royal British Columbia Museum in Victoria. That's an awesome museum to go to. And I did a, a Smithsonian's exhibit design workshop. And I think the most thing that impacted me was the, the archives to see uh, firsthand, to be able to hold, to touch uh, the, the artifacts that got uh, dug up at the Ozet site. There's a, it was over five, um, 55,000 intact artifacts that, that we have. As, it's literally a gift from the past. And so this is a, a, a permanent exhibit uh, up in, in Nia Bay. And we made the, um, like you can see over here, I, I tried to take some close-up shots of, of the, uh, the long houses on how these houses were actually positioned in in the, the dig site, because what, what had happened is there, uh, over 500 years ago, there was a landslide that covered four houses, and it preserved those up until the, uh, it was like 1969, when some big, big winter storms started washing away that bank, because the, the water was washing up against this bank, and it was exposing those houses, and that's when they, uh, there's some hikers found it, told them a cause and then they immediately started excavating those so that we could preserve them so they so they won't be destroyed by nature and that's this is what really sparked my interest to to be a tr traditional artist today and and it will I'll show you how it continues to inspire me and so I I have a timeline here and the the Ozet uh Mudslide was uh, around 1560 CE. So this is the starting point in, in my timeline because this was literally a gift from the past that we were able to uh, have in our possession in 1970. And that's, that's a big impact in, in my work. And then I, I am a, a, a historian and an artist as well. And everything that I do, I, I always reach into the past and I, I see what, what had happened and what, what brings me to where I'm at today. And I, I looked and I, I, I did a lot of study uh, in the, uh, the Pacific Northwest history, Native American history, on the impacts of, of um, ha, you know, uh, the things that I have to deal with as a artist today and I, I put up here there's um, you know the, the, the first European contact is well over uh, you know a, a hundred years after that Ozet mudslide pre preserved our our artifacts and so there was no there was no impact that we we had that <laughs> reserved and be, because there's like in, you know, there is uh, a, a, about 100 years of Indian curio art. It's, it's the souvenir work. And I know that this, this Ozette mudslide preserved that and, and that it's, it had no effect from, from that, um, the, the Indian uh, curio art and souvenir art. And, and so where we're at today is uh, as, as uh, sovereign nations in, in uh, in, in, in the US, there, there's been a lot of acts that encourage us to look back into a past and, and to, to try and build up that heritage that, that, that we had lost, for instance, from, even from the missionaries and, and from the smallpox e epidemics. Like up in Niabe, literally, I would say three quarters of our population were uh, died from, from the, these smallpox epidemics in the 1850s. 
to where we were over 2,000 in Niave, and we went down to just a little, just just a little over 400. It was like four, 416 individuals on on on, the, on that uh, on that census, and then you know just from that that small amount of uh, of people left from that you know that this these horrible e epidemics, you know the the, the kids had to go to boarding schools, they, they, they lost that connection from their elders. And so there's a lot of relearning that, that we're doing today as, uh, as traditional artists. And then here's the map again, just to give that context one more time. And there's like, uh, if, if we go back and these like these anti-potlatch laws, and then um, they they were enacted for uh, you know a, 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 a about a hundred years, and then uh, in these uh, the Indian tribes as sovereign nations in 1968, that that was the uh, Indian Civil Rights Act, and when once those came into place, it it became a safe uh, for for us um, to to where we were able to have our own sovereign nations and our own aesthetic sovereignty in our traditional works. So I, when, when I talk about um, like my, my library research, and you, uh, you, sometimes you have the opportunity to have primary uh, resources, but a lot of it can be secondary. And when you're doing work, like, I, I, I'll look at uh, different pieces, like this piece is from the Smithsonian's Institute. It's, it's, it's a grouse, it's a macaw grouse rattle. And my, my cousin Spencer makes these, and I decided that I was gonna try and make a grouse rattle. And so I looked at older pieces, and so these pieces will, uh, will inspire my, my own work. And there, there's there's some things that 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 are missing when when you're looking at pictures because you're you're trying to look at a three dimensional object on a flat plane, and and you, there's something lost there that I found by by doing the uh, research through books. And the the macaws are well known for making uh, miniature models of. Uh, Whaling canoes, sealing canoes. This is a sealing canoe. And I, I can tell because there's the double end on here. And the, the, the whaling harpoons, there's only one harpoon tip. And so I'm looking at these, these old objects and then I'm recreating them And the thing that I found is, I, I, I initially learned how to make these uh, model canoes from my cousin Aaron Parker, and he learned from my grandfather. So this is a family design of, of uh, the steps that I used to, to make this, this model canoe. And the one thing that he told me, my, my uh, cousin Aaron Parker, is he said, Always make sure that your canoe floats. And he said that in specific because he, he told me a story about a canoe that he had made and a, a, a family bought it and they, they lived over on the other side of the U.S. And that their, their house um, got flooded and the, the, the whole first story of the house flooded almost all the way up to the ceiling, but not quite. And the, the family had to, um, you know, uh, leave and, and, you know, to go to a safe zone. And then when they were able to come back to the house, they said, they told Aaron that everything in the house was ruined from that flood, except for your canoe that it was in the living room and it floated in, and, and, it, and it landed in the center of the kitchen floor. <laughs> and it was, everything was intact. All, all the pieces, all, all, all the hunting gear was all inside the canoe. 
And that, that's why he told me that. And I, and I believe in some of the research I'm going to show you later is that these, these are actually full, fully functional, but they're miniature versions of a full-size canoe. And I, that was my re that was actually my last research. So I, 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 I've been doing research at the Burke Museum Archives, and there are countless model um, diagrams of canoes where you have the side, you know, the profile of the canoe, and then the top view of the canoe, and then sometimes you might be able to see the, you know, the front-on view of it. But there is never any diagrams on the bottom of the canoes. And I thought, this is like the most important part. And this is the most interesting is when I'm thinking about, you know, I'm not just an artist because I'm thinking about physics here, really. And so I was thinking about, this is actually, I think it's a wing. It's the physics of a wing, uh, like on a plane, I think, uh, like on an airplane. And so I, I honestly believe that these, these are fully functional models that, that float. And you can tell how they're all beat up. And like the noses are all ra rounded like they're beechwood. Because they were actually used. They, they weren't preserved and untouched. And I, I'm quite sure that these ones float. And then they have that same shape, that basic shape, where it's almost like they're going to they're gonna fly through the water. And they're going to leave the, you know, the, the least amount of wake be, behind them. So there was a lot of scientific thought behind making these canoes. And I'm just now you know, piecing that together as, as a traditional artist. And I, when, when, I go, when I was talking, to re, I was referring to the curio work and you know, the souvenir art that, you know, uh, that the, the, the local uh, native artists, you know, have, have been making over the last, you know, 100, 150 years. And I found this, and I, I couldn't believe it. it. It says, made by the Niabe Indians, Niabe, Washington, 1928. So somebody wrote in there that it was made by the Niabe Indians. And I thought, wow, did all the Niabe Indians get together and carve this one canoe? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and what this perpetuates is this perpetuates as culture as creator. That we know for a fact that one individual carver made this. And when I'm looking at you know, the, the archives, there's actually this... This person made at least two, of the, two or three of the canoes that are at, at, the, at the Burke Museum currently. And I'm sure you know, that this artist made a lot more. And if somebody did just a little bit more research to find out who actually made these, because they're all family designs, just like the canoes that I make are, is a family design passed down from my grandfather, this person is making a family design from their own family. And to have it, you know, so blatantly <laughs> that, you know, and this is where, you know, as, as we're um, thinking about this, we have the, the you know, the, the, the voice of, of change, that we can change this and we can do a little bit more research to, to, you know, to make this so that this doesn't happen anymore. And this is one of the, I thought was one of the most amazing um, canoe models that, that were at, in the archives. And just to kind of show you how big they were, because when I, when, when I first saw pictures of them, I didn't realize how big these models were. And this particular scene is really interesting to me, because I started breaking it down. And it looks like the, the one who's in the back steering, it looks like he's holding on to this, the, um, the paddler, this paddler's paddle. So we got two pullers, and then we've got two people that are just sitting here. And then up here we have the harpooner, and then we have someone holding the float bags here. And this person here is covering the view of this person. 
That was my observation of the piece. And what I truly believe is that this actually happened. And this, when the person that made this piece is telling a story, and with, because I, my, my family uh, were whale hunters. And my, my grandfather was actually um, the, the last whale hunter in, in my immediate family because uh, of the, um, they outlawed it, they, they, they banned whaling. And we, you know, that's like a whole nother story. But I think this person here is a new recruit and he's trying to watch what the harpooner is doing. And it, that is, the, the, the harpooner is the one who, who owns this, this whaling canoe. And he's the one, it's, it's a very, it's a secret society. And, and when he's harpooning that whale, he, he, he does it in a secret way. And I think that this person is trying to watch and that's not what he's supposed to be doing. So I, I did some research in a book. This, this book, I, I believe, uh, was written by uh, Ruth Kirk, who uh, took part in excavating the, uh, uh, the dig site up, up in uh, Ozat. And uh, she said that this was a bear. So I thought, wow. I'm going to use this as inspiration. I'm going to make a bear. So I made a bear, um, a bear rattle. This piece right here comes up, and then the handle is hidden. So you can't really tell it's a bear. You, uh, you, it looks like a figure, and then it comes apart. And then you can see the noisemakers up here. There's, cop there's copper BBs up there that make the noise. So I thought I was making a bear. And the thing is, is I was using a secondary resource because I did further research. I did my own research in the museum and I found otherwise. And I'll show you what I found out. And I actually found out that not only is this a sea monster, because you can see these on the back. And then it's actually double-sided. So this is a comb that they use for weaving. Uh, the macaws were well known for, for weaving. Uh, we had these little dogs, these little like lap dogs um, that we, we used to harvest the, you know, the, their hair from. And so I studied this piece. And the, the most interesting part about it is this, this piece, you can see the vertebrae and you can see the inside, like it's uh, uh, an x-ray of uh, the sea monster. And there's an old story about, there's this, this guy, um, th uh, this trickster guy named Quati, and he killed the sea monster, and uh, the whole village ate it. And I'm thinking that this could actually be a, a story about that. So I used this idea of making a wraparound design, and I made this sea serpent. And the sea serpent is wrapping around the comb. And you notice I didn't make it a bear. <laughs> and there's other ways that I also preserve my, my work. Is, is the, the, this is my, my father, and he's uh, preparing to uh, do uh, our family wolf dance. And so I made a portrait of him uh, with uh, our traditional family wolf dance uh, uh, headdress. And it's, it's a way of preserving our family history because nobody can actually wear that headdress because it's part of a mask. And so it's it, it's only for that preservation, and, and I'm not I'm not selling anything that can be used for ceremonial use. And so this is uh, one of my most current masks. 
and this is that Quati Quati guy I was telling you about, and uh, he killed that sea monster. And um, what what he did is he he's got this uh, this canoe. It's called Hupitawash, and the canoe powers itself. All he has to do is point in a certain direction. And <laughs> I was I was think, think, thinking about is <laughs> if um, if he was from a different tribe, he might point with his lip. Hupitawash. <laughs> <laughs> then he'll go in that direction. Um, but that's, uh, that's an old uh, uh, <laughs> Indian joke. So there's stories behind this mask. You see where his teeth are knocked out. Uh, he... He took Raven, who's another trickster, he took Raven out fishing because he knew that Raven was a really good fisherman. He's like, I'm going to learn some of his tricks. So they get out to the fishing grounds, and Raven, you know, he's just enjoying his time. And Quatty is, Raven, catch me a fish. Show me how you can catch fish. So... Raven looks around the canoe and he grabs this, this cedar plank and he pushes it into the water and when it comes up, it flies into the canoe and pulls about seven salmon with it and they're flapping around the canoe and Quati's like, wow, that's a great trick. I, I want to try. And so when, when Quati goes and he pushes that stick into the water, you can only guess what happens, right? Boom, straight up into his face, knocks his teeth out, right? And what that is, is, is never try to one-up somebody. In our, that, that's in our own, uh, you know, uh, more contemporary terminology. And this is another uh, story of, of, about the... Uh, that trickster raven, because you've got raven on the top, and we've got a uh, bear, and bears holding a salmon. So the story behind this is that bear, he just caught a salmon, and he's holding on to that salmon, and he's getting ready to eat it. And raven's flying, flying around the river, and he sees bear. He's like, oh, look, bear caught a salmon. He says, I'm going to go trick him, get that salmon from him. So a long time ago, Raven used to have a really nice voice, and everybody liked to listen to him talk. And that's how he got away with so many tricks, actually. And so what had happened is he, went, he, flew, he flew and landed right on Bear's head, and he, he says, hey, Bear, he says, if you, look, if you look up the river there, you can see there's a whole bunch of berries, and they're just, they're just falling off, falling off. And he says, you can see them. There, there's so many berries on those bushes. And then when Bear looks up to, to see those berries, you can only guess what Raven's going to do, right? Raven swoops down and snatches that fish away and flies off. And he's happy. He, you know, he's, he, he stole that fish. But this is what Raven didn't realize that was going to happen. Is he, Raven was just minding his own business one day, and you know he, he was out. It was a nice sunny day, and he was you know uh, catching some some nice sun rays. And Bear sees him, and he comes, and he sneaks up behind Raven, and he grabs him with his powerful paws, and grabs him by the neck, and squeezes him so hard that he breaks his vocal cords and that's why Raven always like ah, ah, today because he can't he can't talk he can't trick people anymore and just to to switch gears a little bit I wanted to talk about my print work and also how my carvings inspire my print work, actually. So I, I started out as a carver, and during my, my time here, um, 
I had an opportunity to work really close with, uh, with Gail Tremblay. And that's why I wanted to talk about the, with the whale hunt scene, uh, because I did a research uh, with, with Gail on the, uh, to make sure that my design was, was as authentic as I, it possibly can be, uh, by like specifically looking at um, the, the, the paddle shapes, the canoe shape, um, uh, the, um, the gear that they used, is I wanted to make that as authentic as possible. And so I did research in the archives and I checked out as many books as I could about it. Uh, and so I, I, I looked at all of the, uh, the actual artifacts that, that we had. And so I, I made this scene as authentic as possible. And then when I was working with Joe Federson, I, I made that design into a silkscreen design. So I did a three color separation and he, he always told me, he says, you, you have to work big, as big as you possibly can. And so what I was, so this is, um, it, it, it's a 42 inch uh, sheet of paper that I printed that design on. The three color separation. And this is a, a sea serpent. And what, what I've found is that there are, a, there are very few individuals that have the opportunity to, to witness a sea serpent today. And the, the sea serpents in this area, they represent power, they represent protection, and the sea serpents show up for a reason. And my brother actually got to uh, see a, a sea serpent um, when, when he was younger, when he was out fishing. And he was describing me how the sea serpent, uh, all he saw was this, this black, big black blob swimming around his boat when he was out fishing. And then the, the, he said the black blob came up really close and then it just came right up, straight up out of the water, about 10 feet away from him. And it looked at him and then it went right back into the water and disappeared. And what I tried to do with this piece is I tried to imagine what that could possibly have looked like. So I learned how to use a Vandercook press. There, there might be a few people in, in here that, uh, that knows what that is. It, it's a letter type press, but I, I didn't use it to do letter type. I, I used it to make uh, block prints. So these are some block prints that I, I made. So I carved this with, with my traditional carving tools. And so I made a whole bunch of greeting cards. And I literally, I was like my own factory. I made a whole bunch of them. And I, you know, I, I, I put them all in their little sleeves. And so towards the end of using these, I, I decided to use these into larger pieces. So I had these little block prints. And what I did is I did an offset process where I, I took the image off of my, my uh, block prints onto a roller and then I rolled them onto these plastic stencils. And you can see like over in the corner there's, um, there's that whale hunter. Up there is the sun. And what I made these, these big monotype prints and I, I called them, they were the, the Culture Shock series. And it looks like shattered space. And I, I don't know if I had Culture Shock from moving from an uh, Indian reservation into Olympia, into the big city. Or maybe, you know, I, I, at that same time, I was in Native American Studies program and I was learning about, you know, the, uh, um, the boarding schools. And, you know, as, as in... Uh, as a uh, local native today, that you know that this is what we're dealing with is we're dealing with culture shock, and this could represent our cultural values and heritage shattered. And so, if we have this shattered heritage, what what can we do about it? So it was almost like a healing process to where one of the last pieces I made, where I started putting, I started piecing back these shards. And, and making images in, so I called it the sunrise. So we, we have a new day today. We have new opportunities to, um, to heal as uh, Native American people. 
So this this game, I I made this quite a while ago. I'm I'm, I'm not sure if there's anybody in here that would be familiar with it. And so I, I made this successful artist game. And I want to play it with with my students this this year. And so what I, I the uh, the board face, this is a two color uh, silk screen design. And then um, the, the, the backing are uh, lino cuts. And my little cards, I, I screened all the little cards. And so what you do is you roll a die and then you move forward and then you play a card. So I brought some cards. So I rolled the die and then I picked up a card. So. What I did is I interviewed about 50 artists, some uh, master artists and some emerging, some just figuring out the, you know, um, you know what to do and, and don't do as a commercial artist. And so these scenarios actually happen to people. So the first one, you get an excellent art review in the local paper go ahead two spaces, right? The bottom of the art market falls out. Everyone go back five spaces. <laughs> you find free web advertising on the internet, go ahead three spaces. <laughs> You're trying to put out too much work and your quality goes down, go back two spaces. So these are tried and true um, do's and don'ts of being a successful artist. And then in the end, you get your foot in the door. <laughs> uh, has anybody played Candyland? Where you get those secret little roads, like, like this one, I can't see it. I can't read what it says here. But it says like, you go to art school, so you get, you get to bypass some spaces. <laughs> so, yeah, fun game. Oh, one thing, if you see these cards right here, See, I've got the, uh, they're like uh, U-shapes that are rotating around. Little did I know how much that would affect my next work. So I started making, uh, these are linoleum block prints, and this was my first one, and it kind of goes over in, I started doing um, multi multi stencil work, where I would um, I would actually use two or three blocks that are the exact same size and two or three different stencils, and I would rotate them, and I and I I'd, I'd print them one direction, and then I'd flip them around, and I'd print them the other direction, and I would get these really amazing effects where I was really going and doing an exploration of of uh, do, doing these uh, multi-layered prints. This is one of my most recent pieces where I'm starting to do um, panel prints where I'm fitting pieces together. And I think the most successful one that I like right now is the one on the right. And this one in particular, it's called Break in the Storm. And I am a fisherman. I, I, I grew up on a fishing boat. And a few years back, we were probably about 25 miles out in the ocean. We were um, salmon fishing, me and my, my dad. And we, uh, the wind started picking up. Waves started getting you know big swells. Like, oh, we better head in. So uh, we picked up all our fishing gear, and we were... Um, you know, still 15 miles out, and we could see that we were literally in the eye of the storm. And we could see all around us how bad it was, and we were actually literally traveling in that little center spot. And we got it 
actually we were about maybe two miles off shore when it when that storm actually hit us and it took us the same amount of time to go four miles as it did to, to go 20 miles and you know in, in those 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 last hours so that that's what that reminds me of so there's there, there's always parts you know of, of my life experience in these pieces they're, they they always influence my work whoops oh well that that last slide was uh it's it's introducing my uh my public works and the um this is where i i'm starting to think about traditional and contemporary forms and designs and specifically with collaborative work i i've got some amazing uh opportunities and you know working with artists um and that that don't do uh um carving and i'm going to show you examples of that in a minute so this piece here you can actually walk over and see it it's it's over in the uh the longhouse and this is like the specifically with uh doing my public works is that you really have to be a strong writer and you you have to be able to write a solid proposal you 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 have to be able to write a solid artist statement on what your work means and that's where writing comes into play when when doing this work and so i had the opportunity to make these murals in um 2009 and the uh the most interesting part of it is the the uh the 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 symbolism behind the uh the figures they're they're um they're interconnected where over over here they're all coming together as you can see and the you've got the wolf on this side and you've got the orca and they're both family oriented they represent the importance of family and how we need to take care of each other and the the thunderbird that represents how we all need to take care of the whole community and the sea serpents represent protection and then over here you can see raven he's he's not tricking anybody but he's bringing food he's he's bringing food to feed people and that's important for us so this is a bentwood box design that was dug up at the uh ozat dig site and through an extensive review uh i i met with a panel up in nia bay and uh, there was elders local artists um the the curators um uh maka leaders and we look we looked at a bunch of different designs because we were going to make a mural that is in the front of the maka museum and we wanted it to represent what what we feel is important about the maka museum and we came we all decided about this particular design and this this is a design of a thunderbird and it is uh it was carved on it's called a treasure box and it it's a it's a chief it was in the chief quarters of the of the longhouse and this is where the chief held his most prized possessions and so what what we wanted to do is is we wanted to respect that and so when i came in and um i drew a uh a a mural concept design so this isn't the finished design this is just something that i i i drew to to transfer a carved design into a two dimensional design that we could paint they loved it 
And the thing is, is I, I didn't change anything. And what we did is we used a projector like we're using today here. And I projected the design onto the place we wanted to paint it. And I, I used a pencil and I, and I sketched it out. And I had an opportunity to work with uh, two uh, e emerging macaw artists. And uh, they, uh, so I, I had an opportunity to mentor them and to show them kind of, you know, the, what, what it takes to write a proposal, what, you know, what, what it takes to meet deadlines, and you know, to have good work ethics to, to, to get it finished. And the, the most interesting thing is we had to be incredibly careful when we painted this because we used uh, cement stain. And because these walls are cement and we didn't want to paint it to where, you know, in two years the paint would start to peel off. We wanted to use something that was permanent. So we literally had to paint these, these designs about three or four times because it kept soaking in, soaking in. And so what, what I looked at is like, we actually made a, ta a tattoo on the front of the Macaw Museum. And there's, there's, there's no, it's, this mural is so permanent into the fibers of the, the, the wall. And so what we wanted to have is we wanted to have this design that represented how the museum is a treasure box for the macaw people. And that is what we ended up with with, with, this, with, this, you know, with this design. And that it shows the importance of, of what the museum means to us in New Bay. The most interesting thing about it is we, we, uh, we got awarded through the Potlatch Fund, if anybody knows what the Potlatch Fund is, and uh, that's definitely um, something that you want to look into as Native artists. And um, they wanted to paint this mural 30 years ago. And I, it, during the opening, I told them that I was so happy that they waited so that I could have an opportunity to, to, to work with, with everybody to make this happen, that I could be a part of it. We also made these uh, whales. And I took a picture of this one. It, this is in progress. But it actually looks like, I wanted to leave it like this, because it looks like the whales are actually entering into the museum. So it would kind of like a welcoming, like, come in to the museum. Um, so, but it, this is what it looks like finished. And the, the interesting part about is we were looking at that, that comb, that, that sea monster comb, and then we look at these, um, these whales and again, they're the, uh, it's, it's like, uh, it's an x-ray of the whale where you can see their bones and that inspires their design work. So last year, actually it was almost a, a half a year before this when we actually started. Proposals, you know, it, it, sometimes you have to be really patient so we got to, we had the opportunity to make uh, two murals for the Tacoma General Hospital for their, their new Rainier Tower. And you can actually go and see these uh, today. And so I work with Tom's Royal. He's over here, you, you can't really see him. But I wanted to sh just show this picture on how big these murals were, because it's, it's crazy to think about it, you know, when, when we're making them, because we're working on little separate pieces that we fit together like a puzzle. And that's what we're doing today is we're, we're, put it, we're laying it out and then we're seeing and making sure that everything fits together before we go and try and install it and be like, oh my God, <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> so we took a lot of time extra effort to make every make sure everything fit and then this is the pro, you know this is the end product that, that that we made and it's called journey home and this is where specifically in the proposal 
we, we, we wanted to re respect the, the local traditions of the, the, the Coast Salish people. And what this story tells, it, it, it tells a story uh, about these orca whales in, in particular. And they were, um, there was a flood, a great flood a long time ago, and these orca whales were trapped up on the mountain in a, you know, in, in a lake up there. And the orcas, like I was saying before, the orcas, how they're family oriented, well, these orcas missed their family. And they eventually decided that they were going to go home. And so what they did is they started plowing right down the mountain all the way into the Puget Sound. And what they created is they created the Puyallup River. And that's why we have the Puyallup River today. And the most interesting part about it is this continues over. This is the side view of it. To give you a context, and it continues on this side, and what that river provided the local people, it provided an abundance of food. And that's what the the salmon and the seal represent. There's always that cycle. We know the salmon are always going to come back and we're going to be able to feast. And then the, the hummingbird over in the corner, this is actually my favorite part here. I'll show you. The hummingbird and the butterfly represent the joys of life. And that's what we need to we think about it. You know, if, 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 you're, if you're feeling down or gloomy, just think about the hummingbirds. They always make me happy when I think about them. They're full of life and energy. This is the new concept design that we're going to make. We're going to make a third, a, a third mural. And this is the journey home. Or no, this is the journey to a potlatch. And this... This has a representation of the canoe journeys. I'm sure most, or at least some of us are familiar with uh, the, the uh, canoe journey and potlatch protocols. And over in the corner, there's a welcome figure wel wel welcoming the guests ashore. And I wanted to kind of showcase the amazing opportunities that we have here at the Evergreen State College. And just in the, the short, you know, this, this last year or so, just the, the amazing opportunities that I've been able to have, where I, you know, I, I, I got to do a collaborative teaching with Joe Tugas for the mask making class. And that inspired me to, to where I'm at today, working um, I'm, where I'm team teaching with, uh, with Lisa and uh, the students on my side of the program are doing wood carving in the wood shop. And then the, uh, the workshops opportunities are amazing. Like I, I, I got to learn from a, a master carver, Pete Peterson. He, he, he taught us how to make bentwood boxes. And I had an opportunity to uh, teach a, uh, a canoe model making class. So all the research that, I, that I've been doing with making canoe models, I, I get to share and pass that on just the same way that Pete Peterson got to share and pass on his knowledge. And the workshops were in the Longhouse Carving Studio. If anybody's had an opportunity to go and see there, if those two doors are open, definitely go and see what people are doing because there's always something neat going on in there. And so this summer, I'm providing an opportunity if, if anybody wants to uh, come uh, and carve with me, I'm providing a Pacific 
Northwest Native Design and Wood Carving class. And this, the focus that we're looking at are feast trays and ladles. And the, the feast trays and ladles, they are used in almost every indigenous community everywhere. And we're going to look, I'm going to specifically focus in on the Pacific Northwest regions. Um, but I, these are some research that I, uh, I've been able to study some pieces at the Burke Museum just a couple weeks ago. And then, so that one, the carving class is first session. And then second session, I'm going to uh, teach a uh, seography class. And this will be an introduction to seography. And we're going to be focusing on um, using photo emulsion. So I have some examples of some of the, my print work that I've done. Where th this, one, this one over here is uh, three color separation. And then I have two color separation over there on the right side. So, these are opportunities to where you, you can really dig in and you, you can see the, the, the different steps in, um, in creating your own body of work using uh, this particular printmaking technique. So I put some of the, the tools that we use in the process at the bottom just to kind of give you a, a context of what this class is going to be focusing on. And this is the sunset. <laughs> this is the end. So, I, it, so I I wanted to share um, at the bottom this this banner. So I, I have a website if, if you want to learn more about um, my research and my work. Uh, there's, a, there's a website address at, at, at the bottom. And so uh, we have some time for questions or comments if you'd like. Okay. So talk about the painting designs on the canoes. I found that um, there are particular family designs when specifically with the models at the Burke Museum I could tell that those canoes were made by either three different families or three different artists from three different families. And so that they, th th those designs are um, a recognition. If, you, if there's a canoe coming forward in, 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 in the water and you're, you're seeing them, you're going to see those designs and you're going to say, oh, that's this, this family, okay. You know, and then you can welcome them to shore. So I, I, I think that that would be part of it. And a, a lot of those designs, if uh, it was both specifically in Niabe, they they would paint a sea serpent design on the bow, and then they would cover it with another painting, and that that design would would be a protection for, for whoever was going to be in that canoe. And so that, that, that's another way that uh, painting was, and de decorations were used on canoes.
created by the Macaw people. Um, and you said you would like to see it so that could, that would never have to appear again. Is that if right? I'm, right. I, didn't quite, I wasn't quite sure I understood what you meant by it. Oh, it's, it's like uh, the idea of the anonymous artist or uh, uh, culture as creator is what we're looking at in, in our program. And it, it's that the um, being able to have uh, an ownership, ownership of a design, because I'm quite certain that, that that is a particular family design and that that, that family should, should have that design really. They, it, they should they should have knowledge that it's there and that they can use it if, if they want to and that's that's one way that we can preserve our, our heritage as as native artists so Alex, when you teach the um, at evergreen and you have non natives in your class how do you deal with the um, issues of So how do I deal with um, areas of appropriation in teaching non-native students? That's actually my first lecture, is uh, to, to be aware of the designs that, that you're, you're using. And uh, to, you know, that you, you, you won't want, there's like, um, there's, you, you don't want to use something that is sacred to a community, like for ceremonial use, and you want to make sure that you can um, have permission to use it. And what specifically what what I, I what I'm teaching is a a style of um, making designs where I, I teach about the three parts of form line and how they fit together to make designs. And then just, just to be aware that um, if, if, if you're working with the design, make, make sure you know where it's from and that you know, there's, there's protection acts in place that you know, as, you know, that um, you don't wanna be selling you know, na native art as a non-native. And, and so that um, it's, there's negotiations that we cover in class and I, I, th I think it's been going really well, actually. Up here? Uh, I was just curious, I really loved a lot of the public works that you were doing, and I was wondering if you could tell us more about sort of pre-proposals, or how do you find um, a project that you want to write a proposal for? You know, when do you come up with that? Oh, well, um, <laughs> networking is huge. And there's uh, the, 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 the longer you're working um, with, with people, they'll, uh, they'll recommend you for projects. Um, for, uh, for this particular, for the Tacoma General Hospital, uh, I'm working with an art broker uh, to, to get these set up. Um, but ma mainly, um, that they're like the, I guess the middleman of, of the we, we we still have to write all the, the the proposals and statements and you know be totally legit on our end, um, but it it takes time. I, I I didn't start doing these these uh, public projects, um, you know, until probably fifteen years in, into my career, so. You just gotta be patient. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you for a little bit more background story on the Oset or the Oset tribe that you kind of reconstructed. And having kind of a hard time understanding that if there were four structures that were buried and in a 500 year period, why this or even a current civilization would not have and, and found their own artifacts. So on one end, it's amazing that you know a couple of hikers or later into the future we discover it so that we can really correctly honor some art. But I just I don't understand that disconnection between it being forgotten about or 
or how some way one civilization can unbury the past, but another wouldn't have the means to or not the interest to. So just in terms of your research and, and working with that, a little bit more on that community. I don't know. Like, I mean, so maybe the question would be, why did the Macaw people wait so long to dig up uh, those houses? Yeah. There, there. Um, so, some some people I've talked to in, in uh, research that people that elders knew that it was there, and they didn't want to disrespect um, the the family the, the where those uh, that the families that lived in those houses and it would be the same as um, like e even when I went up and did research at the museum studying the archives those objects that were in those 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 houses um, the, the the curator told me that he would recommend that I would never replicate any of those objects because I wouldn't have permission from the artist to use them. So he said, study prevalent forms, study prevalent designs, look at shapes that, that you would like to use, but don't directly copy something. And I, I think that even goes back to you know, you know, ideas of appropriation that, we're, that I was talking about earlier. And so the, there's, um, there's people that say they knew about it, but they didn't want to uh, like have anything to do with it. Um, and it, it could come down to family politics. Uh, um, and my, my grandmother was from Ozette. She actually lived out there until she was 10, and then she went to a boarding school um, in Nia Bay. Um, so I, I have a personal connection to Ozette my, myself uh, at, as a macaw. And, um, but the, um, they, they, they didn't want to touch it or you know, do anything with it. But it was when the artifacts were actually falling in into the ocean is when they're like, OK, we need to do something before these pieces are are destroyed by by nature because they were literally preserved intact from the mud because there you know there, there there was absolutely no air so when they when when they dug those pieces up they had to replace that um, that mud with with a, like like a wax solution and that's why the artifacts are all dark all really dark looking um, but there's there's actually a lot of there's a lot of research on it because it's it's one of the biggest archaeological finds in this area. So when you did the projection of the that box, the picture box, you were able to do that because you weren't like planning that it was worth or anything, you were just projecting the Yes. Yeah, I, I, that, that is a good question that you, you uh, posed, is that um, when, when I put the treasure box on the side of the Macaw Museum, I don't have a, a, a signature attached to that piece because that mural is, is owned by the Macaw people. And that, as, as a collective, we, we decided that this design represents what the museum means to, to, to all of us. And I, they, they may make a, some signage at some point to say who painted it, but I, at all, no way do I ever want to take ownership of that design. And <laughs> I, I've been try, trying to be really careful about that. But I will tell people that I painted it because it was an amazing opportunity. And, and it, it's also an, an opportunity to, to share about kind of like, I don't know if I want to call it politics, but you know, just, just to be cognizant of 
of, of designs and the, the importance of them to communities. Um, way up here. Yeah. Like, um, I, I think what, um, like, you know, to, to, to build the shapes up to, to create particular figures, is that, is that what your question is? And that roots back to um, what I call figure recognition and to be able to see how um, you know, uh, a particular character is made by form line because form line is made, you know, it, it's like three, three different shapes that you fit together to, to create a design and you, you can stretch designs out or you, you know, you, you can ball jump, you know, to, to get the effects that, that you want. And it would be like, like if we were looking at orca whales, versus, you know, a, a gray whale. You, you take close look at the, if there was teeth, if there's teeth, it's gonna be an orca, or if there's a big, you know, dorsal fan. And so there, there are ways that uh, you can tell the difference between them. And um, there's, there's some regional style books that goes in depth uh, with, 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 with that question. And um, just, just to, like just a simple Google search, you, you can find some really, really good references on, on books that, that you can check out. And I'm sure that we have them here at the library. We've got a phenomenal Native American art library resource here, here, here at Evergreen. So the first question was, how did I gain access to the to visit the archives? And then um, the next question was, whether or not I thought it, those artifacts should be there. So, so those those questions actually fit together really well. Um, so particularly up. Uh, up in Niebe, I, I called and I made an appointment. This call, um, and I, I, I talked to the curator. And so that, that would be step one. And then, then there, there's other opportunities where you can actually get grants to study archives. And that, that's what I, was, I had an opportunity to do, where I, I, I've been um, going to the Burke Museum with, with uh, uh, Joe Seymour down here at, at, at the bottom, and, and he, he, he applied for a, a, a grant to study the archives. And so there's, there's opportunities to, to go and do that. You just need to search them out. And whether or not I think they should be there, 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 there was a repatriation act where anything that was deemed um, uh, ceremonial was, was given back to uh, the local communities, and um, some. It, it that's actually a really difficult subject, <laughs> because, um, like, say for instance, okay, so, uh, it, are are we all familiar with uh, the transformation mask at the Burt Museum? They borrowed it, and. That was, um, they say it's like the, the Seahawks mask, you know. So I'm like, okay, so there's two, there, that's an issue in itself. And then, so I'm thinking, all right, it made it all the way to Seattle. Why can't it just go a little bit farther back to the Coquitl Nation, where it, I believe it truly belongs? It is... Um, 
a ceremonial mask, transformation mask, in particular because it was used. You, you, you can tell that it, it was used in ceremony by how it, it was worn out. And so I'm thinking about, it's probably a sacred piece for the Kwakutl people. And that my take is that I would probably give it back to them. But then I'm thinking, well, do they have a, a proper place to store it, you know, with, with mu museum quality air? And so there's a lot of things that you need to think about on whether these things should be given back or if they're being properly taken care of. And so there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. Um, does that answer your question? Could you talk about the different similarities and differences between a welcoming figure as opposed to an architectural column and a post? So the difference between a welcome figure and a totem pole? And, and an architectural column and a longhouse post? Or <laughs> post. <laughs> um, they had different meanings in different regions. And the house posts in particular are, are um, most notable in Coast Salish areas. And, and the, where they, they would put their designs on, on the, the upright posts. And the, um, the Macaw people, um, they, they wouldn't decorate their posts, but they would decorate the screens that would divide the different parts of the house. And particularly because like the, the Macaw people would travel between at least two or three different villages throughout the seasons. Because in the summer, you'd want to go to um, you'd want to go to Ozet because you're really close to the seal hunting, whale hunting, and salmon grounds. Because all you need to do is go straight out on the other side of the reef and catch all the all the food you need. And then, so they would have house posts in different areas, and then they'd bring, you know. Um, the rest of the house with them. They, they, they bring um, the, uh, um, what do you call them? Like the walls. They bring the walls and the roofs and then they put them up at the other house. So they, um, they, they, they wouldn't necessarily be important. And then like the, the figures, the, the Macaw people in these local areas, they would carve figures rather than uh, totem poles, because the welcome figures, it, they would be carved so that they would be uh, viewed from the beach, so that if they didn't want someone to come to shore, they had these movable arms that they could move the arms up so that they would welcome the people, and then if they didn't want them to come to shore, they would move them down and they were saying, you better keep going, otherwise we're probably going to battle. So that's, that's how the, the, the welcome figures were used. So they had kind of um, a different function than, than a, a totem pole, because a totem pole could tell the, a family lineage of you know, which families married into which families. So they, you know, they, that, that's like, you know, it would be like, um, like a raven family married an eagle family. So they would put those crests together on a totem pole to, to represent their family lineage. And if they had a chief, the chief's hat would represent how long their families have been chiefs. So the, the hat would come up and there'd be marks on the hat to show generations of, of how, how long that particular family had, uh, had power in, in that village. Does that, does that answer your questions? Yeah. Are we good? We're good. Okay. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. Good questions. <laughs>